police that this has never ever happened then I wouldn't question an assumption in relation to the planning for this particular event that it would be unlikely to happen on this particular event yes. if that, that is the case um, and I stress that the rolling out of the wire would encourage an attack on the police Sorry, maybe I did not follow your, the answer. Are you saying you would criticize an unknown not being factored as a possible risk? No. Hopefully, Chair, again, I'll repeat. If the experience of the South African police, I think is implied in the question, has been that this has never, ever happened before, that the ruling of the war resulted in an attack on the police, then I think that based on that experience, it would be reasonable for, a, as a planning assumption, to expect that the ruling out of the war on this occasion wouldn't result in an attack on the police. However, I'd say I'm basing that answer on the premise that it's provably true, therefore, that this has never happened before. And secondly, I, I'm assuming that it's suggesting that it's provably true that there is an attack on the police on this occasion as a result of the ruling out of the war, and I, I don't give a specific um, judgment on that. I don't think it's my place to do so. And uh, <clears throat> I, I did understand you correctly that you did uh, familiarize yourself with the provisions of the standing order 262 that's correct I, I have read 262 can I invite you that we look at clause or section 2 which is dealing with definitions <laughs> If you go to 2FF, there is a definition for defensive measure. <clears throat> Do you see that? I do indeed. And it says uh, defensive measure refer to proactive tactical measures such as a static barrier, which are used to protect and safeguard people or property by cordoning off, blocking, isolating, patrolling, escorting, and channeling people. That would include something like a, a barbed wire, am I right? I think absolutely it could include something like barbed wire, yes. And if you look at uh, clause or section 11 of uh, that standing order, it, it, it has under 11.2, and says to us, if negotiations fail and life or property is in danger, the following procedure must be followed. And as step one, it says put defensive measure in place as a priority. Okay? It is only two where the warning starts to happen. You agree with me? I agree with you on the force order, yes. So when in Marikana, the police put up a defensive measure like a barbed wire. They weren't expected to announce, in terms of the standing order, that you are now going to be putting a, a defense wire and uh, this is its purpose, etc. Am I right? Against that specific point in the force order, I, I can agree with that. That would uh, contradict your opinion on this point, would it not? I thought you, your evidence was that they should have announced and uh, removed the element of surprise in relation to this matter. Yes, absolutely, and I'm very clear on that. You know, when the police, my, my evidence was given chair on the basis of my experience, and my experience is that when the police carry out a measure, um, it is often likely that you know, one of the predeterminants of crowd behavior will be the activities of the police. Uh, if the police are going to actually carry out an action, then therefore um, the police could anticipate that there will be a response to that action and therefore should warn the crowd. 
Now, my evidence, I think, I hope, yesterday was very clear with regards to I was basing that on my experience on what I think to be relatively well recognized um, crowd management principles. I think I may have res referred specifically even to within keeping the peace we talk about no surprises. So my evidence yesterday was very much on this general premise that if the police are going to do something they should give a warning in advance. What, what Mr. Semenya's point is, is that what they did was in accordance with the procedure enjoined upon them by Standing Order 262. That you can see to be correct. So you can't criticize them, therefore, for not complying with their own standing order. Your, your point, as I understand it, is that your experience is, and never mind what the standing order says, it's sensible to apply the no surprises principle, because if you don't, you may get a reaction from the crowd which you, which you don't want. That is, is exactly, that basically what you're saying? That is exactly correct, Madam Chair. All right. The <coughs> answer to that, of course, is that that may be the, your experience elsewhere, but their experience, says, says Mr. Semenya, is that that's never happened before, and that was why they didn't foresee it on that occasion. And I, and I think you've conceded again that if that's so, if that, if that assumption is correct, then obviously point made by Mr. Semenya is correct, that you c they can't be criticised for not foreseeing something w would happen which um, had never happened before in, in similar circumstances. That, that must also be right. Chair, again, you're absolutely correct, but, 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 but if I could remind you um, of a caveat in, in my response, which basically said, this premise is based on this is provably true. Yeah. And that's why, and again, I apologize for asking the question the first time I've appeared as an expert witness in front of a commission like this. So I'm learning as I go along in relation to the rules and any further questions I'll address through you, Chair. So I apologize for that. You did make it clear that that was, your answer was based upon the acceptance of the premise, not because you accept the premise, premise was correct from your own knowledge, but you accepted if that is the premise, then your answer is given on the, ba on the basis, on the assumption, shall we say, that the, prem that the premise was correct. You, you did make that clear. That's absolutely true, but I'm conscious of the fact that in some of the evidence before the Commission, including perhaps, and I think this would, may have been what uh, Mr. Semenya was referring to, the statements of um, Mr. De Rover, where he talks about, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head, I'm more than happy to check it out, a huge number, and I, I use that word advisedly, of public order incidents that the South African police have dealt with. I have given evidence to say I have no knowledge of those, and I'm just saying from my own protection in terms of the evidence that I give to you, Chair, is that if it can be provable, is if, if it's provably true that this has never happened before, well then I'm absolutely more than happy to say, as a planning assumption, why would Lieutenant Colonel Scott think that it might happen then, if it is provably true? But I'm sure that I will be asked to show evidence of statements that I make to this, this commission. And I think it's only then fair from my protection that I, I, I'd be afforded the same courtesy in relation to actually being asked questions which um, are based on things that are provably true. Yes, but of course, that's, if I say, it's really a point that the council who led you must can argue at the end. And if there isn't such evidence established, then it's a point they can make. But um, it's not no normally wise for witnesses to start asking questions of the, of the cross examiner, even in the circumstances such as we find here, because it creates a precedent. It's a genie that once you've let out of the bottle, you can't put back in again. So, so I think we must avoid that in the future. Carry on, Mr. Semenya. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <coughs> I, I think, uh, <clears throat> Mr. White, the point is even more than that. The evidence is that before the unfailing of the, uh, of the barbed wire, Mr. Noki came and asked what was the purpose of this barbed wire there. Was that information, why, are you aware of that information? I'm aware that Mr. Noki um, approached the police on a number of occasions in relation to the purpose of the, the barbed wire. Um, and if you're directing me to a particular incident um, when he did that, um, if, if you want to show me the reference or alternatively, if we're talking generally at this point, I'm, I'm more than happy to accept the point that he certainly did ex um, approach the police to ask about the purpose of the wire. And as a matter of evidence, it is that uh, 
that communication was, uh, the answer to that inquiry was communicated by the police through a loud hailer, audible to the majority of the people who were in the hill. Was that information made available to you? Again, I've read evidence that suggests that a response to that question was made through loud hailer. I think that the question was posed more than once. I don't know if the loud hailer was used every time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, I, I don't know for certain. And the other point that I don't know is whether or not, you know, um, the majority of the people on the hill heard that warning. Um, certainly, but I know that there was evidence given that, that, that the warning, or the explanation, rather, was given um, by Lord Hailer, yes. And to the... The execution... contemplated by clause of section 11 of the standing order <coughs> is that uh, after the defensive measure has been taken, says uh, the second step, you warn participants according to the act of the action that will be taken against them should the defensive measure fail. You see that? I can see that, yes. Now, the evidence, I don't know if this has been brought to your attention, but I want to solicit your, your opinion. Is that the attack on the defensive measure interrupted the entire plan as it was conceived because it was a happening of the first time? Uh, would you find... Uh, is that understandable from your point as an expert? That they were all caught by surprise. So this is not how things happen, and uh, they couldn't, therefore, from that point on, go to step two, as contemplated in section or clause 11 of the standing order 262. If, again, uh, in order to be helpful with, with, with all of the things that we previously suggested, if this then I think that you were used the word attack happened as a result of, of um, the wire being deployed. I think your question is, would that have taken the police by surprise given the previous experience? Then with all of those things that you've said, yes, I'm sure it would have taken them by surprise if that had happened in that way, yes. And the opportunity to follow 262 sequentially as it is numbered here would, would then have been disrupted. Under those circumstances, the opportunity to follow that, um, as you say, would have been disrupted. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and were, were, were you exposed to the evidence uh, that according to the Sangoma's instruction to the group of people who were taking these rituals, under, undergoing these rituals, uh, was that what they needed to do is, is, is to provoke some action on the part of the police and the muti will work. Are you familiar with that evidence? I'm aware of that specific point as recently as last night. It was brought to my attention, Chair. And ha have you been exposed to the fact that that as an intelligence was not available to the police? Let me talk about the 13th of August 2012. I, I will assume that it wasn't available to the police because TTT, TT5 um, exhibit that doesn't make any specific reference to it. And given the fact that there it was no history of incidents where a use of a stun grenade triggered a direct attack on the police uh, that couldn't be expected on, on the principle we discussed of a, a reasonable officer test to have anticipated it in advance. 
that such a, a, a stun grenade would, would trigger an assault on the police? I think the evidence that I have given is that as a general premise, it tends to be that the behavior of crowds can be influenced by the, the, the behavior actions of the police. Therefore, if we're dealing specifically with the 13th, if I follow you correctly, you're asking me the question that when the stun grenade gets fired, it should be a surprise, you're, you're saying to me, it, it should be a surprise that that creates a reaction by the crowd. Is that no, correct? No, sir? no, no, let me, let me repeat my question. Past police experience has never produced an outcome where a use of a stun grenade triggers an attack on the police. I, I'm putting that to be the fact. Now I'm inviting your opinion on this. If that is factually correct, the police could not reasonably have foreseen such actions such as a stun grenade or a tear gas to be a a trigger for an attack on them. Um, is that reasonable to, to draw that conclusion given your expert uh, experience? You see, my evidence <coughs> has always been that in my experience, actions by the police will create an, a reaction by the crowd. So therefore, that reaction to a stun grenade, which, which um, with respect, we don't we don't use in the UK. But um, the reaction to a stun grenade might be, and I'm sure this is what who, uh, the police probably intended, is that people would run away. That's a reaction. They would move back from that. Um, maybe in other circumstances, when the police do something, it raises the level of emotion within the crowd. Again, I have seen this where the police have used force in, in my context, whether that be AEPs or water cannon. The purpose of those tactical options is to try and get the crowd to move back um, and create some distance. But of course, that is going to inflame, and this is something you take into consideration, you know, the attitudes within the crowd, which actually might result in a, a, a reaction from them. Specifically, in relation to your question, if this situation where a stun grenade has been fired, has never before resulted in an attack on the police, then as a planning assumption, I think it would be fair to say that when you're working out what might happen, consistent with the remarks that I've made about general principles, um, but that would, would it be a reasonable planning assumption that it would not happen in this occasion? I think that would be a reasonable planning assumption. Um, but. I am I'm, I'm relying on the fact that you know the person making that assumption would be aware that this has never happened before in order to try and answer uh, your question and um, because it would be my experience in a more general sense that as I've explained to the Commission when action is taken by the police it creates a reaction and that can, reaction can be very varied and 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 the reaction standard I'm sure even in your country, uh, Mr. White, if you use things like pyrotechnics, uh, you use, uh, well, you don't use tear gas there, but the reaction is to move away from the police and not to attack. Isn't that your experience? The intention in using, and, and the two principal um, types of tactical option that we would use in a circumstance like that would be water cannon and AEPs. And you're using those with the intention to try and get the crowd to move back, to maintain a distance. The reason that we would want to maintain a distance, I give evidence yesterday, Chair, with regards to the types of threat that we would be under, Molotov cocktails, um, blast bombs, the vast majority of those types of weaponry are thrown. Therefore, if the intelligence is or you're seeing that situation live in front of you, um, obviously what you want to do is try and push the crowd back 
far enough so that if any of those types of instruments are thrown, then they won't reach behind the police lines, therefore causing injury to the police. So the intention in firing both water cannon and also AEPs <coughs> would be to push the crowd back. And our expectation would be that that is exactly what would happen. Does that happen in every set of circumstances? No, it doesn't. <coughs> Take, for example, specifically AEP. AEP is directed at a particular individual. The individual that the person who's responsible for firing it is identified as posing the <coughs> biggest threat at that particular time. That's why the round is fired at them. Now, how the rest of the crowd will perceive that is they'll be aware that an AEP round has been fired. You know, they'll hear the bang, potentially they'll hear, you know, see the puff of smoke and whatever. Um, and that one person may well be hit and maybe fall. But you know, other people within the crowd <laughs> will, you know, because they're not being affected by it, might, their, the rage is inflamed, if you like, and they might come forward, that has happened. Other people will, I don't want any part of this now, the police have stepped up and moved back, which is exactly what we want. And then, of course, other people within the crowd might not be aware of that happening at all. So the reaction of the crowd will often be varied. Um, the intention in firing it is to get the crowd to move back. But one of the things that we take into consideration, even in bringing water cannon to a scene, and I think I made reference to this yesterday, is that the appearance of the water cannon, because unlike an AEP launcher, you can't hide them, they're huge, that of itself can sometimes um, inflame a situation in the crowd. Sometimes we'll bring it forward in terms of dynamic planning because you're actually thinking this might achieve a purpose in so much as the crowd see the water cannon and rather than actually be engaged by it, maybe they might just start to withdraw. So, you know, you're actually bringing it, as Mr. Scott might have suggested in stage two of the plan, as a show of force. But you're also um, wary of the contrary effect whereby it actually inflames the situation, raises tension, and I think I gave an example of that yesterday. So the issue is that actually, you know, there's no absolute predeterminant of this, how this is going to work out. And in many respects, that's the skill of a public order commander trying to use his experience on the ground in terms of some dynamic planning. I would love to be able to sit here and say to you, you know, actually, if A happens, then B will happen, then C will happen, then D will happen. Unfortunately, in my experience, it's not like that. As a general premise, when police take action, you know, the circumstances have changed. Something happens, it's like physics, reaction creates a reaction. And certainly, um, in relation to the, uh, the situation that we're talking about, it seems activities of the police then create a reaction. In relation to the question that I'm being specifically asked, therefore, you know, would stun grenades force the crowd to go back? I think the general premise is that, yes, you would expect them to do that. Um, does that happen in every single occasion? I genuinely don't know because I don't use stun grenades. Does it happen every single occasion here in South Africa? Well, of course I don't know. Um, but if the circumstances that are being put to me are every single time this has been used in South Africa, here's what the response was, that the crowd moved back, the crowd didn't as a result of that attack, then I would say as a general planning assumption, in terms of anticipating what the implication is when I fire this, I think that would be reasonable to assume. My question is, does the person who's firing it um, realize that? And how would they be informed by all of this evidence um, which suggests that it has never, ever, ever, ever happened before in South Africa? How would they know that? It depends upon when the planning that we're talking about took place. If the planning took place after the 13th, then there was knowledge that stun grenades do not have the effect of making the people run away because they didn't run away on the 13th. And the further problem that I have and I'd like you to comment on is I don't know about these cases where stun grenades made people run away, but Except that that's, for the moment, that's correct. The people who ran away, were they people who'd, ta who'd taken Muti? Because it seems to me that, and this is a prime face of view, I just want, want to comment on. Um, a stun grenade, I take it, is designed to make a person think they're being shot at. And they're not being made to believe there's the firework that's being lit off. A st stun grenade goes off, you think you think bullets are being fired at you. Nothing happens because it's a stun grenade. That might, in fact, encourage people to believe that the Muti is working. Stun grenades have gone off, two shots have been fired, and nothing's happened. Um, I, I don't know how you respond to that. That's just a prime face of view of mine, maybe it's entirely erroneous. 
Chair, um, I think you know, number one, we don't use stun grenades. Non number two, Muti is, is, is obviously a concept that I was, was unfamiliar with as I gave an evidence earlier on, so I, I don't know. But I can follow your logic, absolutely, and, and certainly as I say, in response to your question, it was brought to my attention last night. I've seen other statements which have suggested um, the impact of Muti. I've seen statements which have suggested things that actions that the strikers who have subjected themselves to Muti, if they do, that might negate to Muti. I've, 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 I've been aware of statements to that effect before. The specific issue of the Muti is not effect, take, will not take effect until such times as um, there's an attack by the police and therefore it needs to be provoked. That's, if I follow you correctly, and you're nodding, so I, I think I do. Um, that specific piece of information um, was, was the first I heard of this was last night. So with that in mind, um, in relation to what you're saying, then I, I think that's, that's, that's a logical conclusion, Chair, yes. And, and, and also, <coughs> I like to that. Uh, these people are having blankets around them, uh, which, which would make the rubber bullets not penetrate, uh, almost fortifying the, the belief that Sangoma tells them that uh, bullets will do nothing to you. Uh, I'm painting this picture, Mr. White, to say, am I conveying to you the fact that we are dealing with a group of people quite different from how your normal public, oper uh, public disorder crowd behaves. Crowds behave in different ways and people within crowds have different intentions and um, suffice to say that there are a lot of people in Belfast um, who engage with this activity that it will be very difficult um, you know, to, to try and work out specifically what they might try and do because they, they put themselves in positions of considerable danger, which I would say is just not logical. Um, you know, why would people do this when they're, they're likely to get hurt in terms of use of force by police or someone else? So I just make that point that we're not always dealing with, with very rational people that make logical assumptions in relation to dealing with crowds. Full stop. In relation to the point around, do I have I ever come across a crowd who, who obviously have undergone the types of rituals and and and, and the belief um, construct um, that, that is associated with with muti in terms of how invincible, invisible, and invulnerable I think are three words that I've seen in the evidence. And absolutely no, I haven't, and I think I've previously given evidence to that effect. But this also points to to doctrine. Because the police can understand that uh, there is de individuation in, in, in crowd unrest situation. Uh, that, uh, that, that builds into the doctrine. What is not doctrine, and I'm suggesting to you, is how this particular group was behaving. Did that, did that come out from reading the evidence to you? There is a lot of evidence that talks about the fact that this particular group, or at least people within it, have, have undergone muti rituals and what that, that means to them in terms of what they believe that it, that it would do. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely crystal clear on, on that. Um, do, does that answer your question, or, or is there a supplementary part to it? Let me try and, and, uh, and, and ex explicate it. The group of 3,000 odd people that were in the copy, once the barbed wire be was unfelt, they disappeared. They walked into various different directions. That would be predictable behavior that the majority of people would move if they see a police action starting, right? At least, well, let me solicit your, your opinion. I think that it's entirely um, predictable that, that people would, you know, if the police are now starting to rule out barbed wire and the situation therefore seems to be now starting to escalate, that, you know, people would 
you know, generally people would move away. And I think, yes, there's absolutely a lot of evidence that a lot of people did. I think other people didn't. Maybe they were just about to move. I don't, I don't know. But certainly uh, there's a, uh, evidence to suggest that other people uh, amongst the 3,000 that you refer to moved away. Yes, that's correct. And, and that would be consistent with uh, past police experience. Uh, uh, and and how, that's how most of these uh, public disorder situations uh, are, are resolved by minimum use of, of, of force, really. Hopefully that, that is the case, that's the intention, yes. But it was in fact the case, that's what I'm inviting your opinion on, it was in fact the case that in Marikan, those who were not in the multi band moved away. And again, I think I've seen um, video evidence and photographic evidence which suggests that, you know, at in and around the particular time that we're talking about, a um, number of people start to leave the copy. I'm aware, you know, because evidence that I've seen that the AMCU uh, um, um, leader uh, for, or president, uh, excuse me, for, for whatever the, the particular title is, I think has addressed them and has now just left. Um, you know, is it as a result of what he said to them and then people are saying, okay, let's move. Is it because of the police then starting to take action? Um, i.e. they can see the nailers with the wire starting to roll out. Is it a combination of those things? Um, I, I genuinely don't know, but I, I'm absolutely saying to you that, you know, I, from the evidence I've seen, that at a point when the wire is rolling out, and therefore at a point after the gentleman from the AMCU has spoken and has left, then, you know, other than the particular group that you're focusing on, other people are leaving the copy. Yes. And you're familiar with the fact that the AMCO president, as you refer to, was pleading with this group of multi band to say, please go away. You, I, yeah. I think he actually said, on, on my bended knees or something, there was a reference to right. that. I'm pleading with you. Yes. Right. And further, he pleaded with them to go away. He went on his bended knees and told them that if they didn't go away, they'd be killed. And the evidence is they didn't take what he said seriously. They, they said they were ready to be killed, and they, the, the group, this is the evidence. Um, we, we, there may be other evidence later which will be different. But the evidence is that the sort of, there was a bunch group at the front who, according to the evidence of um, Mr. X or the, or the Matarapos, they were the ones who apparently didn't t pay any attention to what Mr. Matunjwa had said. Mr. Matunjwa spelt it out quite clearly, told them to, to go, pleaded with them to do so, went to his bended knees and told them they didn't do it, they'd be killed, and they don't appear to have taken that very really seriously. There is an argument, of course, that there was a bit of delayed reaction and they then eventually did decide to leave, and that's one of the issues we have to decide later. But uh, on the evidence that we have, as I've summarised to you, the facts are as I've given them. Yes, Chair. To add to the cocktail, to add to that cocktail, I don't know whether it has been brought to your attention or, or you have read the evidence that this involved also a, an employment environment involving migrant labor where you find people in the majority coming out of the Eastern Cape and, and coming to work in a different uh, Northwest province up in the country. Has, has, has this been brought to your attention? I haven't, uh, in all honesty, seen evidence to that effect, Chair, but I haven't had the privilege to be here for a number of days now. Um, certainly, I, I've been made aware of, of that um, intricacy, if you like, um, as a result of just conversations that I've had and with my legal team as they've tried to you know, explain sort of some of the context. So well, the issue of migrant labor, I, I, I know very little about, but I, I, I'm familiar that there is a, an added complication around that. But as I say, that has been on the basis of conversations with my, um, the, the legal team who I've spent obviously a lot of time with, as opposed to, I don't know that I could point to specific evidence that I've seen to that effect. And, and, and they come and work using a language quite different and distinct from the, the the language of the people who live in those neighbourhoods. I'm not aware of that, but I know that from the 13th, I think, there, there was evidence around a particular language. No, 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 there are two points. Um, the, the, 
the two points. The first point is most of the rock crew operators were people, most if not all, of the rock crew operators were people who didn't come from the Rustenburg area. They came from what are known as the labor sending areas. Most of them came from Eastern Cape Ponderland. Others came from Lesotho and Swaziland and, and so on, Mozambique, I think, too. Most of them were, were Pondos, though, from Ponderland, and their langu the language they speak is Tosa. The people in the rustenburg Marikana area, they speak Setswana, which is a Setswana language. Tswana. So they were a different ethnic group, spoke a different language. That's the first point. The second point is that on the mines, they have a lingua, fr lingua franca, which is known as Fanagalo, which is actually a, an artificial language composed of bits of various uh, of the vernacular languages, some of them so-called Nguni languages, the Zulu and Kosa, and some of them bits of Sutu and Twana and so on. Um, the evidence in relation to what happened on the 13th, the Monday, and thereafter when Lieutenant Colonel McIntosh came and negotiated, um, the language used was Fanagalor, this, this artificial language which is used on uh, this lingua franca uh, used on the mines. So, uh, uh, that's the point. But the further point is that, to try to give you use a language, use a term you may understand, the, uh, these people come from, uh, the, the, most of the workers are migrant laborers, they are what would be known in German as gas uh, gast arbeiters. Except I think a lot of the gas arbeiters actually permanently stay in, in Germany. Many of them work for BMW and they live in Bavaria making BMW motor cars. Um, they come from Turkey and various other places. But the, the position appears to be in Europe that many of them then put roots down and stay permanently in the country to which they've come, to, in which they work. The experience here is while well, some, some, uh, some of that happens, but not very much. Generally speaking, uh, our guest arbiters come work in the mines and other industries and so on, and then go back to the places in which they come, taking the money they've earned. They remit money, of course, to their families while, they, while they're working, but they also try to save money and go back, in many cases, buy small holdings and uh, uh, lead, a, lead a traditional kind of life, raising cattle and that sort of thing. Um, th th that's the background. Um, it's a... The migrant labor system has been operative in this country for well over a century, if not a century and a half. And there are all sorts of problems that it brings in its wake, which are matters that the, the, this country will have to deal with in the years to come. But it's very, very central to what goes on at, at not only at the London mine, but mines generally. Uh, I think that's the, I'm sorry I have to give you a little lecture for that, that's really the background you need to know to understand the point Mr. Smeen is putting to. Did I put it correctly, Mrs. Smeen? In, indeed, Chair, and, and, and just to round that point off, uh, I don't know if it has been brought to your attention that their permanence in Rustenburg is also undermined because the people there would consider them alien. In fact, Chair, you, you recall uh, Advocate Horoyadira acting for the Bamukhali saying they came and infested our land here. So I'm trying to. Well, the witness, the Bapo Bamukhali is the, tri the tribal authority. Uh, it's the, the, the tribe of people who are, are, who are, who are Setswana, they, they speak Tswana. Um, and they, uh, the evidence, or the a, a, a assertion made to us by the council who appeared for them in an application we had some time ago. Well, there was a great deal of resentment by these people um, to this influx of, of, of migrant laborers who came and took the jobs away and the, and the money they would otherwise have earned. And so, on. so there is a, of course, it's not, not correct to use the expression xenophobia because they're not really, really foreigners in, in, in the South African sense, but they are almost treated as if they are foreigners because they are from different ethnic group in, in, in within South Africa. So according to what was put to us, there are quite strong feelings of hostility towards them on the part of the local people. How true that is, I don't know, but that certainly was an allegation which was very strongly made before us. So that, I think that's a correct summary of the position, is it, Mr. Smith? It, it is indeed, Chair. Yes, Mr. White, so th I've tried to paint a profile of the 
the three, four hundred people. Now, I, I want to try and deal with the statements that at least point us to the lengths with which the, the matters they perpetrate to reveal how grisly uh, uh, they were. Shall we go to, uh, again, exhibit quadruple A, 1.2? Paragraph do you want to refer us to? Uh, if we can start at paragraph 12, uh, Chair. Now, uh, this comes This is a count of what happened on the 13th, isn't it? This, uh, no, on, no, no, on, 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 on the 12th. Uh, um, oh, I beg your pardon, yes, quite right. This is what happened on the 12th, the Sunday Co morning. Correct, yes. yeah. In the vicinity of the hostel and the, yes. the taxi rank, yes. yes. Chair, uh, apologies for interruption. I just uh, have a simple question, Chair, just to, to um, reorient Qu Quadruple me. A, 1.2. Yes, indeed, and I have it in front of me and, and the, uh, the, uh, the Chair. It's page 7. And this going is, on to page eight. Ju just for clarification, sir, I apologise. And this is a statement from Mr. X. This is uh, Mr. X's I, statement, I the, the uh, first statement, the statement he made in February 2013, and he's describing what happened on the Sunday morning when the two security guards employed by London were, were killed in the vicinity of the NUM office and the taxi rank in the hostel. So. You would see uh, on, on page seven. I should say, when, he's des when I say when he's describing what happened, he's describing what he alleges happened. Of course, Chair, thank you. Number paragraph. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if you go to that page, just before paragraph 12, there is an unnumbered paragraph. It, it just gives us context. That very one. Uh, well, on page 7, where it starts on Sunday. You see that? I see that point, yes. It, it describes in broad, broad terms uh, that they take a decision to go to the offices of NAM, uh, and they say, took the decision was that we are going to fight anyone who stands uh, or block us on our way. That's, that's the background. Then the security guards come there, if I just rush it through. And they were going to fight with their weapons, uh, the knobkiris, the pangas, the spears, the bush knives. And they also even had a firearm in their possession. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And if you go to paragraph 12, uh, which is where I'm trying to point our, direct our attention, then says the security officials then started to shoot at us. And by retaliated by shooting back at the security, and it was when the situation went out of control. The security ran away as well while we were attacking them in large number. Emphasize the point is the attack is in large number. I saw the two security officials try to get into their vehicle and we blocked them and assaulted with our weapons. I personally stabbed one of the security officials somewhere on the mouth or face. I stabbed him with a butcher knife I had with me. I saw by, by shooting at the security and took his firearm and so Anela shooting at other security official. Anela took his firearm and the cell phone. After Bai taking security cell phone, he gave it to one Chesi. I also saw Mambush taking a two-way radio and the cell phone from the security officials lying down outside the vehicle. I saw one Bele had a two-liter container with petrol and poured on the security vehicle and it caught fire. Anela took blood from the security using his panga and put blood into a plastic. 
Bele then cut off the chin and tongue of the security who was lying outside the vehicle and put them into the plastic that Anela had already put the blood in. One of the guy whom I saw also stabbing the security guy was Rasta. I also saw Bai putting the security official out of the vehicle. What I'm saying is, um, it's a very grisly description of, 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 of a brutality on another human being. Would you agree? Uh, uh, it's, it's shocking. And, and not typically that which you would find in public disorder environments necessarily. If there's been a killing, it's, 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 it's been a killing, but this, 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 this is something else. Uh, again, I, I haven't come across uh, this type of thing in my experience, no. I have come across situations obviously where people have been killed, um, but in terms of the, the sort of the ritual aspect of the, the, the follow-up, so post-mortem it would seem, um, uh, no, Chair, I haven't. There's a further fact that when he gave evidence, Mr. X said that they took a decision that they would kill anyone that came in their way. Uh, the, the statement just says that they would, I think, fight with anyone, but he specifically said they would kill anyone that came in their way. Thank you, Commissioner. There are, there are other statements of various witnesses. Um, if I have to go there, I will. Also demonstrating the action of the group being an action in concert. Uh, did did the, your reading of the evidence uh, reveal that, reveal that uh, picture? I think it's fair to say that the evidence revealed a degree of organization um, and, and to some degree uh, sort of a, a mutual intent. You'd, how far that spread across the 300, I, I, mean, I, I can't honestly say, but in trying to be fair, you know, ch um, Chair, uh, you know, I would say that I understand the point that you're trying to make that, you know, this is not one or simply two individuals who are sort of acting, you know, of their own initiative as such. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to accept that point, absolutely. And, and, and the evidence we are told to when the three, four hundred of them, uh, the evidence is also that when, when the group of three or four hundred of them were to go around the crawl, this is now on the 16th. Uh, no, Mr. Noki then says to all of them, no, you don't have to run away. Uh, we have done nothing wrong. We are all going home. And the surprise element, and this is where I'm inviting your opinion, is they all agree to go in the direction that he's leading them. So I'm suggesting that the argument on our part will be that they were acting as a single concerted group under command and instruction with a bent on a very murderous route. I think ultimately that's a question of fact as to whether they Correct. were or not, and that's obviously for yourself, Chair, as the Commission. If it's helpful to the Commission, as I've said, I do see um, you, you know, evidence of acting a number of people at least acting in concert as opposed to these people all acting in, as individuals could i a, again offer to the commission if it's helpful um you know again i've a plenty of experience of of this i've seen crowds of two or three hundred who will open up despite the fact that they're throwing stones or whatever a large section of them perhaps to the side or in the middle of the crowd will open up um revealing someone standing with a gun behind them um, the gunman will fire a number of shots towards the police and the crowd will immediately then obviously move back across shielding uh, our sight of the gunman while he gets away. You know, again, Evan, so I, I've, I've experienced people so acting that, in concert. Yeah, that, that then is an illustration of all or most of the members of the group acting almost as one. I, I, hopefully it's, a, it's an example of experience of, y yes, yes, uh, yes organisation. Yes. A lot of people certainly acting, understanding a plan and operating in accordance with it. I absolutely accept that there is no element of 
this concept of protection by muti or whatever in, 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 in the context that I'm familiar with. Um, but, but I just added that in hopefully for assistance in relation to my assistance to you, Chair, as, as someone who has a degree of experience in this type of thing. So that was specifically around organization within crowds. Uh, Mr. Semenya also used the word de-individuated. And we've had a number of cases in South Africa where expert evidence has been given of, of mob violence. Expert evidence has been given that there's an element of what's called de-individuation. And the, some of the members, or some number of the members of the group act in a way totally out of character because of the this de-individuation effect of operating in a, in a mob situation. Uh, I take it you must have encountered um, theories of evidence of that kind in, well, in your experience. If it's helpful, I actually make specific reference to some academic um, learning within my um, um, final statement. I make particular reference to um, uh, work by Professor Stott, who I think at the time was connected with Liverpool University, but I'm not sure if he, if he, if he still is. Um, Professor Stott does a lot of work with the UK police generally. He's involved in training. He's involved in helping to develop doctrine. Um, uh, but I think that one of his central themes is that um, when he first started engaging with the police a number of years ago, he felt that perhaps the, the doctrine and the thinking that informed that um, he was concerned was out of date because it largely engaged with you know, what are called traditional crowd management theories informed as far back um, by Gustave Le Bon from the sort of late um, 1900s, um, or, or sorry, 1800s, um, uh, which talked about mob mentality and a crowd acting as, uh, as one. Um, uh, Stott's work, uh, along with others, um, looks at it very differently. His, his, his work would be referred to as the elaborated social identity model. And within that, what do you talk about is that people actually still act as individuals to some extent. And this is part of the um, thing that I was referring to earlier on. It's almost, you know, the actions of the police that might have, forgive my perhaps poor use of, of language, almost a radicalization effect on some parts of the crowd. And it may well be that perhaps an overreaction by the police might draw together some people who previously you know, we're within a crowd almost as individuals and now all of a sudden they have a sort of a common identity because they're experiencing the same thing at the same time by the police. So it refers to it as an elaborated social identity model. Um, but I mean, all of this is to say that to a large extent, the, the, the doctrine in the UK um, and, and I think certainly further, further afield, certainly within Europe, would be that um, Le Bon's sort of theory of this, this crowd um, you know, people sort of act in as a single entity because they sort of, uh, if you like, get the protection of the anonymity of the crowd and whatever and take on this sort of single mindset is, is, is flawed thinking. And I say that just in, in a European context. It may well be, and, and, and I'm not clearly an expert on this, that maybe the introduction of the um, added ingredient of the Muti type issue might, might change that. I can only offer you my experience and expertise. I'm just trying to explain to you the word that... Um Mr. Semenya used de-individuated de was a reference to theories based on the work of Le Bon, which was exhaustively covered in a number of matters that were, came before the courts in the 80s and early 90s when there was mob violence and necklacing and that kind of thing. And a lot of evidence was led by experts, psychologists mainly, of this, the Le Bon theory. And I was involved in a matter with Uppington, which was quite a notorious case at the time, there was a lot of evidence of that kind. And what seemed clear was a number of people were acting out of character. You had a wide range of people, all sorts of uh, occupations and types of personality. And, so on. and when they were together uh, in, in this, the action which led, led to the, uh, the case in which I appeared, they, they acted out of character, you see, and we had evidence which was accepted by the court. Um, and there are a number of other cases where it, similar evidence was accepted. Now, and that's the basis, I think, of Mr. Semenya's uh, question. And in fact, we've even got training manuals that were put before the Commission, police training manuals, where the Le Bon theory is expounded as sort of doctrine accepted by the police. So um, I put that to you for what it's worth. Of course, it also has a bearing, I take it, on the question you've been debating. And that is whether one can criticize the police for making certain assumptions. If, if the Le Bon theory is accepted as doctrine in police training, whether it's <laughs> right or wrong is a different question. You, 
in, in judging the conduct of the police and the, uh, w whether they can be criticised for planning on the basis of certain assumptions, if those assumptions are what they've been taught, if they, those assumptions are doctrine accepted by the police and, and accepted by the courts over the last few decades, then it's difficult to criticise them. I think, I think that's all. I'm sorry if I took, took your questions away from you, uh, Mr. Semenya, but that's basically the point you were building up to, I take it. Uh, indeed, indeed, Chair. Now, Mr. White, I, I don't know if this information has been brought to your attention, but uh, there was even a, a decision at the copy that only one cell phone would be allowed there. Has, has that information been brought to you? I, I don't think I'm aware of that particular piece of information. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure if I've seen that and I've forgotten it. I, I think it's a, quite a significant point, the fact that it is only one, so I'm sure I would remember it. And I, I'm more than happy to engage with that piece of evidence if you want to direct me to it, or alternatively, it's a more general point that you're making. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear your question. I think you can accept that, that is the evidence. Which again is evidence from Mr. X, whether Mr. X's evidence is going to be believed at the end of the day is a matter none of us knows the answer to at this stage, but that certainly is the evidence he gave. And apologies, um, Chair, to, to you and, and to Mr. Semenya in that I, I misinterpreted when he said um, one single cell phone on the copy. I was imagining this was an agreement amongst the three and a half, you know, the 3,003, as opposed to just the particular group. Perhaps that's no. what you're talking about. And I'm saying I would have remembered it. The evidence of... Um, of X, Mr. X, is that there were various discussions on the copy, and uh, it was agreed whether, uh, you know, there was certainly, whether it was agreed by everybody is, is, is something he can't talk about, but it was, appears to be an accepted without dissent, as it were, without you know, vocalized, expressed dissent, that that would be what would happen, that there'd be only one and so forth. That, that, that's Mr. Semenya's question. Correct. And, and Chair, yes, thank you. And, and also, that seems to be an explanation for the death of Mr. Twala on the, on the 14th, who it was found after interrogation, he had a cell phone and th that had airtime on it. Uh, that information is, are you aware of it? I'm familiar with evidence concerning the, the death of the gentleman that you talk about. I'm familiar that there was evidence in relation to discussions specifically about the fact that he had a mobile phone. Uh, I'm not familiar with the I suppose the causal connection necessarily that, that I think you, you refer to that perhaps because he had a mobile phone and there had previously been agreement that there would only be one on the copy, then in some respects that marked his fate. I'm, I'm not aware of that particular aspect, I would have to say. Now, I'm painting that, that picture to, to drive the point that collating ongoing intelligence about the thinking of this group, what they are planning to do, when are they planning to do it, how they are planning to do it, is seriously compromised in the light of the set of facts I'm, uh, I'm painting. Would you accept? Sorry, when, when you said is seriously compromised, I, I thought that all of the things that you said, what you were suggesting, is all of these things tend to suggest that, that you know, this is a group acting in concert as opposed to compromises that fact? No, so it, it would compromise the police capability of finding reliable intelligence to inform their planning. I, I, it, it may well have an impact on it. I mean, if this, yeah, if this group is acting, and, and I'm aware of other ev evidence which, which basically suggests this is a tight-knit group and it's very hard to penetrate, and, and of course, therefore, that, yeah, I'm absolutely happy to ex um, accept that that is going to have an impact on the police's ability to be able to actually um, re re get intelligence um, from within the group. Whether it makes it impossible, I, I don't know, but I'm more than happy to accept the premise that, of course, it, it's likely to make it more difficult, yes. Now, when I try to follow your evidence about inadequate intelligence in relation to the Marikana operation, uh, did I understand it to say the intelligence was inadequate as a function of one or other negligence on the part of the police in not picking it up when it was there? I, I made the point that when I in, was engaging with the evidence and I saw um, the exhibit TT5, which was um, labeled as a composite, 
of all of the intelligence um, that was available to the police throughout this operation. And on that piece of um, paper, um, there were 10 entries. I think if memory serves me correct, and, and um, if you're prepared to indulge me from memory as opposed to me, me looking at it, but I think the first three, possibly four, maybe three entries relate to incidents that happened in February. Um, I think then the fourth one. The point was there were basically only three two items, three two or three items, items of, of what you Actually. would call intelligence in, in the document. Um, you were surprised that it, regard being had to the period it covered, that they could only have three, th two or three bits of information, and that you suggested indicated inadequate intelligence gathering, as I understood you. That's correct, Chair. And then I went on to say that even engaging with one of the people, pieces of evidence which I would consider to be actionable intelligence, and I referred to the statement of Brigadier Engelbrecht and the conversation then that he had with General Mapembe when it was obvious that um, it seems to me that um, Brigadier Engelbrecht didn't feel that the intelligence that he had actually taken the trouble to send a text on to um, Mr Mapembe and subsequently speak to him about it had been actioned in the way um, that he would have expected it. So my comment was in relation to intelligence, um, I was surprised at how little there was um, and, 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 and I was therefore making an assumption and I stand by it that uh, therefore you know, the, the operation must be compromised up to a point in relation to that lack of intelligence and then secondly the, the point that even where there was actionable intelligence there were questions with regards to um, how properly that was acted upon. Related to what happened on the Sunday, <coughs> Sunday the 12th, um, what, yes. the, what the police were supposed to do was to beef up, if that's the right word, the visible policing activity and um, in the light of the information received and that they didn't seem to have done properly, hence these incidents that took place that uh, we've been talking about, the, the security guards and so on. Um, and according to Brigadier Engelberg, <coughs> General Mpembe was dissatisfied <coughs> that there hadn't been appropriate response to the, to the intelligence. Of course, what we know is thereafter, <coughs> there's a massive increase in the uh, forces available, the forces is the word they don't like, M the members of the police service <coughs> who, were, who were there, who were responding to the threat, as it were. Um, it was a relatively low-key operation, as far as one can tell from the evidence on the Sunday, but certainly uh, as the time went on, the... Uh, degree of intensity of police operation increased dramatically. So it doesn't follow that intelligence information would have been responded to as per perhaps as it's inadequately as was the case on the Sunday. But uh, I think to put the whole thing in context. I'm told I may be wrong when I said that the security officer killing took place because of the lack of visible PC. Anyway, but for the rest of it was right. That um, there was a message sent, information sent to Mpembe, which he passed on, and he later expressed disappointment that it hadn't been adequately responded to. That, that part's correct, is it not, Mr. Smenu? Yes, yes, Chair. Uh, that part but is. But the point correct. I was making was that thereafter there was a dramatic build-up of, of, of resources, police resources. And so that op fact did necessarily operate either at all or as strongly thereafter. Yes. M Mr. White, I wanted us to, perhaps to tidy. Oh, sorry. Perhaps just for a point of clarification, therefore, in relation to my evidence, um, is that uh, I, I think I commented on this yesterday. Um, given the, the, the sparsity of the intelligence um, and the fact that um, Brigadier Engelbrecht uh, contacts um, um, General Mapembe in relation to this particular piece of evidence. And I absolutely un understand your point, Chair, that the resources for this operation are gradually building up. But, you know, for me, it's, it's, um, it, it, I think it's important to note, I noted it, that not only was this one of two or three specific pieces of intelligence, the fact that um, Brigadier Engelbrecht, who is, I think, the, a very senior person in the intelligence branch, 
feels that it is so significant and so important that he contacts the overall commander in relation to this. Now, I appreciate, you know, resources are difficult. Um, it seemed to me that the conversation that they had was around visible policing in order to try and police out this threat. Chair, you referred yesterday quite correctly to the situation in my country where, given the long-standing nature, we would have informers placed within particular organisations. Sometimes the intelligence that comes back from that is very specific, sometimes it's less so. We would lots of experience whereby, say for example, we know that potentially there's going to be a bomb moved into Belfast City Centre in a particular area. We're not sure exactly the time, exactly where it's coming from or whatever. One of the responses to that would be to have a very visible policing presence. Firstly, if that intelligence is absolutely accurate and therefore then a bomb is moving in, there's the possibility of interrupting that. But number two, because if you put that very visible policing presence out, the people who are behind this threat, you know, they're careful and conscious too. All of a sudden they see heightened policing presence and they start to think to themselves, oh, the police know something. And therefore that might deter the, the movement of the bomb in the first place. We would refer to that as policing out the threat. It seemed to me that the conversation that Brigadier Engelbrecht was having with um, uh, Mr. Mpembe in relation to here's this particular piece of intelligence is, that, that seems to be what he had anticipated or what he wanted to happen. I think in fairness to Mr. Mpembe, when they have the subsequent conversation, his reply is, um, it didn't happen as I intended. So I don't know, I'm, I'm blind to what particular instructions Mr. Mpembe gave and how let down he may have been by other people. But the fact remains that actually here was this identifiable piece of evidence or intelligence that they might have been able to do something about, and it certainly wasn't done to the satisfaction of certainly Mr. Engelbrecht and potentially Mr. Mpembe as well. There are two distinct things, Mr. White, I'm trying to, to tidy with you. The one is there was intelligence not properly acted upon, and that's not what I'm discussing with you. I want to discuss the second part. Is it your evidence that the police were remiss in collecting intelligence that was there? I'm saying I, am, I was very surprised at the lack of intelligence. I don't know the reason why there was such a lack of intelligence. I have seen evidence, including the statement, um, for example, of, of um, Officer Victor, which indicates some of the activities that he had undertaken in order to try and obtain um, further intelligence. Uh, I am not, I haven't been provided, I don't think, with you know, a full explanation with regards to why there was only two or three pieces of action, actionable intelligence of course, across the course of a week. I'm saying to you in response, I, I fully understand and I don't deny, I'm sure that there were many, many difficulties in trying to obtain intelligence, um, but I still come back to the point that the operations, specifically on the 13th and the 16th, the level of intelligence that were informing those operations um, was, was very, very sparse. Now, I know it is sparse. I'm saying, is it as a function of police remissness? That's what I'm asking you. Well, I think that there are certain um, uh, pieces of evidence that you could point to with regards to um, what you call police remissness. Um, for example, um, Lieutenant Colonel Scott, I said in my evidence yesterday, issues what I would term an intelligence requirement. He specifically asks for some intelligence and then... I'm, I'm, I'm confident that he gave oral evidence um, that, that he never ever got any response to that. So I think that you know, that would be um, a, an example whereby uh, th there's, there's a remiss. On whose part? Just give me the individual. On the part of the South African Police Department. Where was that intelligence and on your the, on the part? Uh, shall I say it is, it is five past three. Uh, for something, but I think I was going to raise with you whether we haven't reached the stage which might be appropriate to take tea. But uh, you, do I understand you to say that it is appropriate? Uh, it is, uh, Chair. All right, well, well let's, let's act on that and take Thank tea, gentlemen. Thank stage. you. 15 minutes.
Hi, Jess. My name. <laughs>
Commission resumes. Mr. White, you're still under oath. Thank you, Chair. Mr. White, just before break, I wanted to understand uh, what you called police remissness in relation to intelligence gathering. Are you saying they were remiss because despite the request by Colonel Scott, no feedback was, was given? Um, overall, I make the assessment on the basis of the sparsity of intelligence and you've, I think, um, before uh, T, you'd said that um, y y there is a sparsity of intelligence. Um, dealing with, on, I, I'm saying that I understand, I'm sure there were huge difficulties in relation to um, trying to gather intelligence, but nonetheless, I still think the outcome therefore raises questions. So I then look to um, specific um, issues, and I deal specifically, Chair, with um, uh, this at. Um, page 60 of my final statement in paragraph 6.2.2. Um, if it's helpful to paraphrase, I, I make reference to the fact that Lieutenant Colonel Scott suggests that he had sought intelligence, uh, sought intelligence on the area's roads and the attitudes um, of the area's population. Um, community um, intelligence, um, tension indicators is, is the sort of things that I, I, is the language that I would use in, in relation to what he seems to be seeking. Bear in mind that he's the chief planner. He puts out what I've previously described as what I would consider to be an intelligence requirement. He says, this is what I need um, in order to help me um, build this plan. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott then gives um, oral evidence. Uh, he also, he talks, I think he gives evidence potentially, I've, yeah, oral evidence to the fact that um, no information came back with um, the exception of some small um, piece of information in relation to something to do with, with the roads itself. Um, I can point you to the transcript, rev um, the specific transcripts. Um, uh, Chair, if it's helpful, um, transcript 13418 um, uh, to 9 is where, um, in oral evidence, Mr. Scott, um, under um, questioning by Ms. LaRue, again, talks about this um, requirement that he issues around intelligence. And the same tra uh, tr uh, transcript 15125 is where he then responds, uh, or, or then in, in relation to questions from Ms. LaRue, then um, indicates that, that he, he doesn't actually receive any intelligence back um, with regards uh, to, to that matter. You, you see, I have to... Sorry. You the lack of that specific intelligence that he requested impacted adversely on the planning? W what I'm attempting to do um, is basically say that I struggled to understand how this operation over the period of, of a week only had two stroke three pieces of actionable intelligence. Um, I, I, I think that the lack of intelligence significantly impacted on the um, success or otherwise of the operation. That's one of my key criticisms. So engaging with the evidence in order to be fair, I have been alerted to the fact that the South African police have said that there are specific issues here which are causing a problem with relation to intelligence. I'm, and I'm prepared to accept that. I, I fully understand that. So I'm now pointing to particular pieces of evidence where I'm saying, well, Lieutenant Colonel Scott issued um, an, uh, uh, an intelligence requirement um, which would have helped him. He wouldn't have issued it um, if, if he didn't think it would have helped him and yet he got no response back in relation to that. So I think you know, that's evidence of a contributing factor. Had uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott got information back um, specifically in relation to what he was asking for, would have that have had a significant um, impact on the ultimate outcome of this operation? I don't know and, and to be absolutely fair I don't think the specific types of um, intelligence that he was asking for would have made this big dramatic effect. But I'm using that basically to say, look, I think there are intelligence failures here. Um, overall, again, I come back to my main criticism, an operation of this scale of magnitude running over this period of time with such a dearth of intelligence. And now here is an example, Chair, to you to show you that how clearly the processes were not properly working. Um, 
which basically helps to reinforce my overall point. So I'm not saying that the specific piece of intelligence would have had a, a you know, the, the impact of changing the outcome of, of the tragedy of Mark Hanna. The question is whether the particular intelligence that he requested and the lack of any response adversely affected the planning because he was the chief planner. What is the answer to that question? I think it adversely affected the planning because he is the chief planner, yes. How so? Well, ultimately, Lieutenant Colonel Scott was trying to establish, uh, you know, what the view in the local community was right. and what, what basically to try and find information around um, the attitudes of people generally. So, you know, when we're talking about this, this crowd on the copy, um, whilst we've been focusing very much on the, 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 the warrior group, as has been described, not, it's not my description, but that, that, that's how, how it's been described, but the information that he was seeking was then perhaps going to be informative in relation to how other people um, might respond to police interaction. Because potentially, if the police had have moved forward, maybe, maybe, people, maybe people in the community said, we want nothing to do with these people. In fact, we would like the police to deal with them really, really harshly because we are frightened of them, we are concerned about them. Maybe um, people in the community would have actually said, look, to be honest with you, you know, they uh, appear to be making sort of threats and gestures and whatever, but actually, you know what, we know a number of them and I don't think there's anything in that. Maybe they would have been basically saying, look, um, at the end of the day, these are the people who are actually standing, fundamentally standing up for our rights, so we have a degree of sympathy with them. Those sorts of things then would have fa potentially factored into the decision he made. So say, for example, you take the last premise, then you've got to take into consideration, well, if we take any action in relation to this warrior group, actually the intelligence is telling us that the other 3,000 people are potentially going to be very supportive of them. So instead of dealing with a group that's potentially going to be resistant of the police, which is 300, maybe then the activities that the police take because of the inter community intelligence is coming back to suggest that we're going to engage with a group who are going to be resisting us, which is 3,000. I think that is particularly significant information. The basis of that is that the, the, the community that you talk, you equate the community to the 3,000 people. I, I, I simply say that the community um, in Maracana are a source of information and intelligence. I think, in my experience, it's up to the police to explore every avenue. And I think, to a large extent, Colonel Scott, I'm assuming, I might be wrong, agrees with me. That's why he issued that um, uh, uh, intelligence requirement. And yet he got nothing back. I'm not sure he agrees that it had an adverse effect on his planning. But he agrees that he asked for it and didn't receive the information. Apologies, Commissioner, just to be clear, when I said that I think he agrees with me in that I'm saying that if he, you know, the fact that he issued that intelligence requirement, I think that logic would suggest that Colonel Scott feels that the information that would come back is going to be of value to him. Otherwise, why would he issue it? Um, whether or not with new information coming back, he feels that that had a, a significantly detrimental effect on his planning, I don't know. Equally, if he didn't get the information, he must have planned accordingly, mustn't he? Well, obviously, he is taking um, um, uh, decisions in the absence of that information, but I think that he does um, give further oral evidence that obviously, you know, the planning is to some extent um, undermined by the, the lack of intelligence. Yeah, I want to deal with another aspect of intelligence. On page 60, to which you referred us, in the, um, from the third line downwards, you talk about the kind of information which you would have expected to see. Um, this might have included information in relation to the intentions of the protesters, i.e. how long they intended to maintain their protest, details on individual key members of the groups, where the majority of the people who left the copy each evening went, how many remained on the copy overnight, who they were, the likely number of firearms, etc. So I would have expected to see this information being updated and fed into the, the jock on an ongoing regular basis. Now, some of that information might have been difficult to get, the intention of the protesters, how long they intended to remain and so on. So the indications, I think, are that they intended to remain there until they got their 12,500 rand. But, um, but what we do know, because Brigadier Engelbrecht tells us this, is a process was on the, on, on the go 
to get certain information. He talks about, I mentioned it to you yesterday, it's in his statement. They got a whole lot of detectives from Gauteng. They spent their time um, analyzing the still photographs, I think the videos, together with Lonman human relations people, to try to identify particular people. Um, presumably they would have concentrated, I would think, on those who were visibly bearing, not the sticks and so on, but, but pangas and assegais and possibly and firearms. Then, presum presumably they would have expected the London people his Bill Jones, and this is his address. He lives in this hostel, or he lives in, in a shack in the informal settlement, and, and so on. Um, that appears to be an ongoing process, which uh, I can only assume, uh, we may have more evidence later, but only assume that it, it hadn't yet reached finality. Uh, I understand your point is they should really have given the results as and when they came in. But um, it does look as if they were, they were still busy with it and uh, they'd, they weren't yet ready to do anything specific with it. You also refer um, to the uh, proposal to have um, a cordon and search um, based on, on uh, and I think Pembe had talked about, yes, it's paragraph 6.2.3 on um, page 61. Um, you say, I note that stage five of the operational plan involved, quote, intelligence-led follow-up operations to arrest places of residence, unquote, and stage six of the plan involved a cordon and search operation which would necessarily have been required intelligence to be effective. And you say authorization was given for this operation. There appears to be no intelligence gathered to support that operation. Well, the, uh, my understanding of that is this. If they... Uh, arrested people, as they were proposing to arrest people. They hope, I think they hoped to get information from them as to which, which would have assisted them with stage five. As far as stage six was concerned, that appears to have been dependent on two things that I mentioned to you yesterday. One was the results of this analysis of the still photographs with, read with the information they hoped to get from London. And the other was a response from NUM uh, in consequence of the request that in, General Mpembe made to Mr. Sequana that the Num people must tell the police which of the, their colleagues and the miners have got dangerous weapons and where they keep them and so on. And that request was only made on the Wednesday night. And that was, of course, the night the decision was taken that, the, that come what may, if the weapons weren't handed down, Thursday was D-Day. So there wasn't, much, there wasn't any time to react to that. That, I would think, appears to be the answer to the point you make. It's not necessarily correct to say no intelligence had been gathered, but certainly not enough time had elapsed for such intelligence that had been gathered to be processed and put in a reportable form. But um, the, if they had not decided to go ahead on the Thursday and they decided to wait till the Friday when they had f more information of the kind I've discussed, it, it might have been different, but uh, that's one of those what-if questions, isn't it? Indeed, sir, but perhaps I, if it's helpful, I, I could deal with those um, because I, I don't want in any way that you know, my um, information or, or evidence to you is in any way misleading. Let me look at the 6.2.3 in the first instance. And what I'm saying is I, I talk about the, the cordon operation, and, and I think that's a very good um, uh, 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 tactical approach um, to, to take to this. It's... It's again trying to police out a threat. You know, let's go and find these guns. Now, if the only information that uh, stroke intelligence that they were going to base that um, uh, cordon application on um, was basically on the information that they got on the arrests at stage four or five of, of the operation, well, then of course that there will be no intelligence prior to the operation. However. But, the, but the, there were the other two things. There was the res response they were hoping to get from Mpembe's request to, to Zakwana, and there was the material they were hoping to get from the analysis of the still photographs from London, which would have provided information as to who the people were who had weapons and where they lived. And that apparently was an ongoing process, which I take it, we must assume, hadn't reached finality because otherwise if it had been, there would have been some evidence of it. But of course, what we're also told is I, I think the, the curtain goes down 
essentially on Thursday morning because uh, the last bit of information which is, is mentioned is the information that was given, albeit subject to typographical uh, mistake, possibly, uh, on at 6.30, I think it was, on um, uh, Thursday morning, although there's some suggestion that it was, it was, there was further information given at 12 o'clock, although, in fact, I, I thought at one stage, in fact, I'm still, still not sure that, I'm, that I was wrong, that in fact there was a mistake when those, I told you those minutes were heavily edited, that when, the, when the, the minutes were finally produced at roots, some considerable time down the track, the intelligence given at, at, at 12 o'clock was reported as having been given at, at, at 6.30. But in any event, that appears to be the point at which the curtain went down on, on such evidence has been gathered which was reported. It doesn't mean they weren't going on with intelligence gathering, and who knows what evidence would not have been available at, say, 6 o'clock on Thursday evening if they'd then gone over to the cordon and search operation, which had already been authorised. I, I think I agree with, with everything you said, Chair. I think you're absolutely right. And to add to that, um, the, the conversation that I was having with the Commissioner um, earlier on with regards to um, the intelligence requirement that um, Lieutenant Colonel Scott set, it may well have been that the, if the police officers were out within the community and asking for community intelligence, you know, one of the issues that may have come back might have been some information which might have been assist of assistance in relation to this coordinating application as well. The point that I'm making here in at the, the very last few words in relation to um, 6.2.3, no intelligence gathered, was, there appeared to be no intelligence gathered to support that operation. Why do I say that? I say that because TT5 says this is a composite of all of the intelligence. Now, I said that in my first um, provisional statement. I've said it, in my, you know, so I've been engaged in this process over a, a period of time. If there was ongoing intelligence and, and perhaps actually there's been an oversight and it hadn't made it for the purposes of this commission into TT5 TT then, apologies, um, then I'm sure you know, it was within the remit of the, the SAP's legal team to actually say, actually, TT5 you know, was a moment in time and here is all of this other intelligence. But you know, here I am sitting in front of you, sir, um, at the end of June in 2014, having engaged with this process over a period of time. And one of my key criticisms carried over from my very first um, um, statement is saying about lack of intelligence, and I point to TT5. Um, no one has ever come back to me and said, no one's ever come back to you, more importantly, sir, and said, well, actually, TT5 is not all of the intelligence um, that, that actually is, is available. So um, I, I make that judgment on the basis of, of that particular uh, piece of evidence that I've engaged with in relation to um, the Commission. And perhaps, ha perhaps we don't know, had um, Lieutenant Colonel Scott's uh, 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 activities have been carried out as he requested, maybe there might have been more information um, to, to assist with that coordinating operation, is the first point. The second point is that I, I'm aware from evidence that I've engaged in uh, engage with around um, uh, the investigative arm of the operation and also perhaps the intelligence arm. And, and I would also then point to um, the statement of um, Mr. Victor, um, if perhaps the uh, reference, is, is this right? I, I think it's unexhibited, but it's um, uh, Mr. Johannes Jacobus Hermanus um, Victor. Uh, he's from the intelligence branch, and I, I engage with that particular um, piece of um, evidence and he talks about the different things that he was attempting to do in relation to uh, you know gathering intelligence and, and I, I support and congratulate him for that and um, he, he talks at 4.9 of that statement about interviewing possible witnesses security officers and members of the public to obtain um, intelligence and and to ID suspects some witnesses asked me not to divulge their IDs um, for fear in relation to their safety which is entirely uh, you know something that you can anticipate and of course he's not going to divulge those but, you know, I, I would question then, well, 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 what happened as a result of those interviews? Um, if, if those did, in fact, take place, you know, what valuable information did you actually get that you were then able to put into the system, which would then have informed TT5, but more importantly, informed the operation? So, I mean, all of this is in relation to um, your question, sir, with regards to, you know, do I see, you know, any particular remiss or, or failings? Um, those are two examples. Uh, as I've engaged with the evidence where I'm saying, actually, I do think that there are some feelings. I, for the record, I have stated frequently that I absolutely understand 
that this is not an easy process because of all of the things that, that, that you say, sir, um, and all of the things that have already been put before the Commission. Was it hard to get intelligence? I'm sure it was. But I still come back to the point, my overarching criticism is this operation, I think, was handicapped on the basis of poor intelligence. Um, the intelligence composite, TT5, has 10 entries, of which two stroke three are what I would consider to be actionable intelligence. Um, it would seem to me that there does seem to be of some degree of breakdown in the processes which actually feed the intelligence into the people that need that information in order to make informed decisions. Whether or not if they had much more intelligence it would have ultimately um, led to a different outcome, I genuinely don't know. That's an assessment that you'll have to make, sir. Um, but but you, you know, I'm here to help to provide um, evidence on the basis of my experience, and that's it. Mr White, given the difficulties that you admit they were and the climate, it's possible they tried very hard and didn't succeed to get intelligence. It, that, that may be so, but... Uh, again, I would point you know, as a single example to that particular issue that I've talked about with um, um, Mr. Scott. He asked, um, and I don't think that, I mean, th nothing came back to him. We would have been having a different conversation if it had been that there was a report back to say that no intelligence is available within the community. But that, that's not the case. Yeah. You, you see, Mr. White, I, I have two aspects to take up with you on that on that answer one you are now throwing conjecture on a question of fact which shouldn't be your province what you are saying is there was intelligence obtainable but not obtained or obtained but not conveyed to mr. Scott it's a, it's a province where you cannot be as an expert <coughs> Well, then, I, I apologize to the Commission if I've overstepped my boundaries, and I mean that sincerely. I, I genuinely do apologize. But you, you were asking me a question in relation to intelligence. As I said on, on numerous occasions yesterday, I, I point to the Exhibit TT5 as, as, as the key document that I was relying on in relation to my criticism around intelligence. Then, then you asked me a question, was it about, you know, there was a remiss, in other words, people hadn't, I'm assuming, my assumption was that your question you were asking me was that perhaps people hadn't done what they were supposed to do. And, and in my answer to you, I was saying, well, here are some examples. And genuinely, Chair, if I have overstepped my mark there, um, I absolutely apologize. Because we agree with you entirely. There wasn't adequate intelligence of the nature we now know. Uh, we now know a lot more and would have planned uh, this operation a lot, lot better, having a clear understanding what threat was there, et cetera, et cetera. But you and I agreed earlier. That's not the, the, the probe now. The probe now is to look at what on the ground was the intelligence available and whether or not we acted uh, properly based on it. Am I correct? Well, of course, an operation can only be based on the intelligence that's available and then taking appropriate actions and steps in relation to that intelligence. However, my evidence to the Commission, uh, you know, I was asked, you know, I give uh, evidence in relation to um, criticisms or concerns in relation to the operation and the criticisms, you know, one of the chief criticisms was in relation to the absence of intelligence. Um, All right, I think we have exhausted that. Uh, to use the word criticism in this context. What you say is, top of page 60, um, I would have expected to see considerably more information telling this line 2, page 60. I would have expected it. And then you say the kind of thing you would have expected. And you then um, you, you deal with Scott's request and there appears to be no response. And you deal with TT5 and, and, and TT4 and so on. What it amounts to is you expected a lot of information, which, what, intelligence, which wasn't available. Whether it wasn't available because they, they tried hard and couldn't get it is something we don't know. We have to speculate about that. There's fact a question mark on that. If they got information of the kind you mentioned, you know, the um, people who went home every night and how many remained on the copy and the likely number of firearms, if they got that information, which they may have got, which we don't know, then 
uh, of course, it wasn't conveyed. But so there are two questions. One thing seems to be clear. Whatever information, if, if did they, if, so there are two points. Did they get information? It, it, it may be they didn't get information despite vigorous efforts to do so. If they did give information, then the criticism would be they should have c communicated that, and they didn't. I think we can accept that they didn't communicate any information other than what they say they communicated. So the real question is, did they get it? Should they have got more information than they communicated? Did they do their best, or were they slack and lazy and inefficient and so on? In other words, were they to blame for the fact that they didn't get information? And without knowing what efforts they made, without knowing what obstacles they encountered, without knowing how much resistance there was, we can't really make a judgment on that, can we? So we can't criticise them. We can say the intelligence was poor, in quotation marks, but whether it was culpably poor, in the sense that they, were, they should have got more than they did, I'm afraid that's something on the mat material before us we can't make a judgment on. That, that must be right, surely? Well, then, um, thank you for the clarification, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to agree with you. <coughs> uh, Chair, can we... I intend to deal with a video footage to deal with a particular aspect. Uh, video footage takes more than seven minutes. Yes. Well, uh. well, not not s uh, seven minutes, but what what it would do, it would entail us replaying it in the morning, to to make a connection with the questions I intend to put. It sounds like a point that I can't resist. We will, despite my wish to be able to do so. So we'll adjourn now until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you, Chair.